you know, people will be recycling more. Public transport. Solar power. Recycle more water. Alternative fuel. Wind power. More green roofs. A green roof is where you have a vegetated rooftop, so you actually grow some plants on a roof. Sounds nice and pretty, but surely a couple of flowers stuck up on a roof isn't going to make much difference to us or to the environment. But then why are green roofs compulsory for buildings all over Europe? Could there be more to these hippie roofs than meets the eye? Well, considering they clean the air, insulate our homes and reduce global warming, it's fair to say they're not just for hobbits anymore. You may not have even heard of green roofs before, but they've actually been around for thousands of years, first established with the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. These eco-roofs have since evolved through history, changing in both appearance and structure. You wouldn't realise it, but you probably pass by a basic form of them almost every day, like this pyracantha for example. I lived in these halls of residence at Royal Holloway University for a whole year without ever realising that all this was just above my head. The true value of green roofs to both the environment and to people was recognised by Germany in the 1960s. Since then, roughly 10% of German roofs have been kitted out in glorious greenery, with the rest of Europe and parts of America also embracing this environmentally friendly practice. Vegetated roofs come in all different shapes and sizes and range from having dense to minimal planting. However, they are officially classed as either extensive or intensive. Extensive roofs like this one are most common because they're cheaper to build and easier to maintain. They require shallow soils of 3 to 7 inches which supports low growing, hardy grasses and turf. Intensive roofs, however, can harbour a more diverse range of flowers, trees and vegetables because they have deeper soils of 8 to 14 inches. But the extra weight of these deeper soils means that sometimes more funds are required to reinforce the roof. So a lot of buildings in Britain do not possess a roof which is structurally capable of being greened. It's quite different in Germany and Switzerland and countries like that where you find the proportion of green roofs is much higher. And the reason is because the roof is structurally more sound because it has to take the weight of snow. However, it's not only the strength, but the slope of a roof that must be considered before fitting an eco-roof. This is an extensive flat roof. And this is an extensive sloped roof. While completely flat and angled roofs up to about 40 degrees, can both promote successful vegetation, it's usually the shallower slopes that work best. Once the strength and slope of a roof has been approved, building can begin. Firstly, waterproofing materials such as rubber are laid to protect the building from damp and root penetration. Secondly, a drainage layer is added, often made of recycled crushed brick or glass, which allows water to move away from the roots so the vegetation isn't drowned. Next, the growing media is laid, which is often just lightweight soil. And finally, the plant species are sown or put down as a pre-growing mat. Sedum is commonly used on green roofs because it is hardy and requires little maintenance. However, it is extremely important that a living roof fits in with its surrounding environment, so they are often left to self-colonise, which increases biodiversity. This is what's known as a brownfield site. While it doesn't look much, this is actually a haven for birds and insects, which is pretty unusual in the middle of London. The land has been left undisturbed, allowing wildlife to populate the area naturally. When this land is built upon, ideally these exact conditions will be replicated on its roof, thus replacing the habitat that's been lost. Just like this one. By using local materials and not sowing sedum, local plants have been able to colonise the roof, making it a perfect home for invertebrates from the surrounding area. Those plants which are 
local to this area will encourage those rare invertebrates which you will find down at ground level. If you just had a cedar roof, you get limited um, flowering um, during the season. They only flower in June and July. We've got toe flax up here, which is actually uh, good for toe flax brocade moth and is a very late flowering plant. It flowers in August and September, which gives the bees something to feed on late in the year. Sealums only flower in June, so they're only giving a nectar source in the month of June. Living roofs are also well known for supporting rare species of insects and a small bird called the black red start. Now black red starts were known as the bombsite bird or the power station bird. They like it, you know, they like rubble and they like sparsely vegetated habitats, which is what this is doing. Um, but importantly, it's not just one single level. You'll notice that down here it's about 50, 50 mil in depth. Then you've got these mounds going up here with different soils on them, which are about 150 mil. And because you have different depths, you get different structural vegetation. So on the higher mounds, really rich vegetation will grow down here on the lower areas you'll get sparse vegetation and what that does it creates a whole range of micro habitats for rare invertebrates and for biologists at least promoting biodiversity is one of the most important functions of green roofs and it's particularly important in urban environments because um, you know we're reducing green space at a, an incredible rate and green space not only is good for biodiversity it's, it's, it's good for a whole range of things but Traditionally, in, in the countryside, we're losing our dry, well-drained habitats, and actually green roofs are actually dry, well-drained habitats. But so much for the wildlife, what can green roofs do for us? Research published by Nature magazine suggests that we should never be more than 300 metres away from an accessible green space. It is thought that contact with nature, such as birdsong and seasonal colour change, is essential for good health. But today, this is getting more and more difficult in urban areas, as buildings sprout up and land values soar. Roof gardens and terraces are possible options, as are green roofs. Beneath me is an office of hard-working men and women who are lucky to have this rooftop escape away from their desks. Spending a small amount of time every day on a living roof can help reduce your stress and lower your heart rate and blood pressure. Green roofs can also do wonders to soften up an urban environment by introducing colour and shape to a dull, angular space. A Texan study of post-surgery patients indicated that recovery was faster when a patient's room overlooked a green area. Hopefully the patients recovering at this clinic, over the road, are benefiting from the sight of this living roof. Community projects have also sprung up around the installation of more green roofs, as they provide a focus for helping the environment and creating a pleasant shared space for residents. This particular project involves local youths building roof furniture and planters to decorate a newly installed grass roof that members of the surrounding area can enjoy, as there is very little other green space nearby. This is one of a number of eco-roofs built here at Canary Wharf as part of an action plan to benefit Londoners and the environment. Here you can see the vast city skyline and the layer of smog blanketing the buildings. And I can only imagine the amount of harmful gases and particles being pumped out into the air every moment by cars, burning fossil fuels and industrial processes. This air pollution and the damage it can cause when inhaled every day is a serious worry for people living in cities. Harmful pollutants float around in the air as tiny particles which enter our lungs and accumulate, which can lead to disease. However, grasses and plants on green roofs can capture particles on their leaves and absorb them into their system, 